you know, technology, as, as good as it is, it's interesting at times, isn't it? Oh, it's amazing, eh? Like, there's, I've done so many, so much Zoom stuff over the last year, and no matter how much you rehearse something, um, of course, when it's go time, you'll have the uh, you'll have the glitch that that you really wanted to avoid. But I think people are people are so forgiving overall. I, I found that you know everybody's had to adjust and there's been so many little issues along the way people almost half expect something to go wrong in every list every single session so it's been it's been pretty good overall. we just dealt with 2020 right so <laughs> exactly. we have to be lenient exactly yeah, yeah for sure so paul for the listeners tell me your story how did this start i mean i, I know i've been following you and you've been following me for quite some time now and you know things have just progressed with yourself and you've done some remarkable things and, and I know, you know, that too, <laughs> things that, you know, not many people have done. Well, I mean, I've, I've been fortunate to have the, the ultimate backyard, of course, I have a lot to work with. Um, and I've had a lot of support from friends and family. And that's been, um, that's been huge in the yeah. process for sure. And so, yeah, so that's led me to, uh, led me to, um, being able to document, places and and events that uh i could have only dreamed of you know 10 20 years ago so yeah i'm super thankful and and um yeah i i the, the in short uh i moved to banff about 12 13 years ago um with uh the intention to give uh give it a year basically uh i moved here with my wife now wife megan and we decided to see if we could be based out of the Rockies permanently while still doing something that would keep us outside as possible, as much as possible. We didn't want to be in the mountains to, um, you know, to be stuck uh, between four walls all the time. We wanted to do something that will really allow us to uh, grow our passion for the outdoors. She went down the writing route. She did good. I went down the photography route things went well for me also. And yeah, we haven't really looked back. I mean, we've been uh, fortunate to pursue our passions for over 10 years now um, in a professional, um, you know, manner. So we, we do this for work in a place that is, you know, uh, oh, it's, 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 it's the dream. <laughs> it's oh, it's the dream. I mean, people, People dream of, of spending just a handful of days here once in their lives, right? And to wake up here every day, I mean, it's just, we're just so, so thankful. Are you and your wife from Calgary originally or? No, not at all. We're actually both from out east. I'm from Quebec City originally. My wife is from Ottawa. Oh, and wow. uh, yeah, yeah. So we're, uh, our families are a few provinces away. Uh, did the love story meet, uh, come together in the mountains? The love story did come together in the mountains. Oh. Yeah, we met we met at Bow Lake. We both worked at Numtaja Lodge yeah. uh, several years ago, and uh, we met. Uh, yeah, we met at the lake there, and um, sort of we met doing uh, what we still enjoy doing together. You know, play, playing outside and exploring, and so um, yeah. So it was a wonderful setting for that whole story to start. No, of course. Yeah. Now, Paul, were you were you a born photographer? Would you say, or what, did you go to school for photography? How did this happen? This passion? No, I I was never really um, I never really explored creativity until I was really firmly in the mountains. Uh, I never I never really considered myself to be an artistic person. Even now, I think like many fellow photographers, I, I sort of suffer from the, you know, the imposter syndrome a little bit. And whenever people, I still hesitate to call myself an artist. It still sounds a little bit strange to me. Um, but it, it's, I think once you spent enough, enough time mm -hmm. in a beautiful place like the Canadian Rockies, exploring eventually i think sooner or later you you feel compelled to document that in one way or another and some people will feel some people will pick up uh, a paintbrush others will write others will um document it through video whatever i just happened to pick up a camera um and, and initially for me it was just i just wanted to show 
our distant families, guys, look, look at look at our backyard. This is what we're up to. This is what we do on a near daily basis. You know, just just wanted to um, keep them informed as to what you know what we were doing with our lives out here because it was a bit foreign to them, of course. And then um, eventually I realized that photography could be so much more than just dryly documenting what, what we're up to and showing mom and dad. I mean, it's a wonderful creative outlet. It's a great way to um, make people aware of the power of, that the wilderness can have on their lives, um, make them aware of certain issues. It's, it's incredible to me that through photography, especially paired up with social media, you can impact people anywhere on earth within milliseconds with a simple arrangement of pixels. And, and the, power, the power of that, uh, the power in that still just blows my mind, you know, several years into it and keeps things really, really exciting. That ability to not just um, from a personal standpoint, to just further my my um, relationship with the wilderness, but also to be able to impact others um, with those images, it's extremely exciting still for me. Where have you seen your photo reach on social media? Like what areas of the world have has it reached? And people reach out to you and say, "Hey, Paul, this is amazing." It's been it's been just incredible. I think it's it's we still tend to um, I think um, sort of underestimate the power of photography online you just you know it's easy to just go about your business you go out there you explore you create and and sort of as as a byproduct of what you do you put it out there for others to enjoy and to respond to without really thinking about it for a long time and then once in a while you'll get a personal message that people will will have put a lot of time into a time and effort and thought into to tell you on a personal basis how a certain image or, or, or a bunch of images impacted their lives in a positive way in a time where they needed it or whatever. It's incredible um, when you get those types of messages and they're reminders that, wow, like, yes, I'm doing this first and foremost for myself because it gives meaning to my life. But once in a while, you're reminded but that it does give some amount of meaning to other people's lives as well. And that's just the most rewarding thing, of course. And with social media, I mean, there's no boundaries, right? You can reach people uh, in the Bow Valley. People respond very strongly to the photography, of course. But you'll have someone in India who will never get anywhere close potentially to uh, to a glacier or, um, or, or to... Uh, um, you know, to a remote area and they will, they will respond just as strongly. And I think that's a beautiful thing. No, this is amazing. Do you feel like social media has helped obviously your, your business grow? Oh, there's no question. I mean, I was very fortunate that I started more or less when social media really exploded yeah. and it's allowed me to put my images in front of so many people Whereas only 10 years before, unless you printed something pretty much um, or you had an art show or something, there, there was, I mean, your options as far as mm -hmm. reaching an audience were so limited and now, now sky's the limit. I and remember so, there was, yeah, uh, everything. <laughs> yeah, well, when we first started, there was Cal Snape, remember Cal, Caleb? Yeah. yeah. And it was, there was you, yeah, out there. And I was like, oh my God, you guys just... He, he left Banff, though. He, I think he moved to BC, but you, yeah. you stayed out there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm not going anywhere. I like this place uh, way too much. Um, we have two little girls here. Yeah. Uh, we're excited to raise, you know, mountain girls. And, uh, and this, is, this is where, I mean... This is home for you. Now. Oh, there's no, yeah. there's no question. Any way you look at it, I mean, we're tied to this place. So, um, Paul, what's the background? What is the image in the background? That's beautiful. Oh, that's from a, uh, that's the Stutfield Glacier. That's, wow. that's from a, yeah, from a little winter hike to the Stutfield Glacier a couple of years ago. The light was beautiful and I just, uh, yeah. I still fun. have this photo that it's somewhere on my computer that I have from years ago that you did. It was on a lake and it was in the night and you just had it shining bright, the light. I don't know, you've done it a few times over, but uh, I yeah. think it's Peyto Lake. Okay, yeah, yeah. That yeah, was a while ago, right? 
It was a while ago. Yeah, there's yeah. been a lot a lot of other great nights under yeah. the stars since then, for sure. I mean, that's been for me uh, a really the um, the nighttime side of things has been central to my work throughout. Some things have come in and out for mm -hmm. sure in terms of interests, but astrophotography has remained sort of at the core of what I do throughout. I'm still just blown away by uh, the quality of the night skies that we have. And of course, the skyline that we have, the skylines that we have that, that pair up with that. It's just, uh, it's an incredible canvas as a photographer. Were you, were you self-taught? Yeah. yeah, I was, I was self-taught. I think, um, some people learn better in a more academic environment. Uh, the way that my brain is wired, I think I, I just, it's the same for everything. I just need to go out there and do it a million times until I figure it out. And the hands-on like, experience. Yeah, take lots of bad photos and I still take lots of bad photos, but uh, I just need to go and, and get the hands-on experience, yeah. as you said, and eventually just something clicks and I sort of figure it out on my own. And so that's, that's the route that I went, but the, the beautiful thing about doing photography is there's just so many different ways to, to get it done. Yeah. Did you, what was your first camera? My first camera was, uh, interestingly, I, yeah, my, my, the way I went about things was a little bit different. When I decided that I wanted to pursue photography seriously, I basically got a Canon 5D oh, yeah. delivered to Bow Lake. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And so I started with pretty much the top of the line camera right away, instead of just sort of moving up through the different stages. Of course. <laughs> and, uh, but then I spent all that money on a camera. And, uh, and so I was kind of, uh, I was very compelled to use it, of course, after having committed that amount of money. Oh. And um, yeah, so I had like a 1740 lens and a Canon 5D mm -hmm. uh, arrive, uh, arrive at Bow Lake. And I remember just sort of um, fumbling, you know, along the shores of Bow Lake in the morning, trying to, trying to get something that, uh, and discovering that, uh, you know, raw files look nothing like what you see with the, I was, you know, of course, disappointed to see how, you know, kind of bland the images looked as raw files. And so that, that was, you know, a little, I was a bit disillusioned. Uh, I think like many people, I expected the gear to spit out something, you know, amazing. Yeah. But <laughs> that's up realized, to you then, right? That's oh, the yeah, hands. Of course, I mean. of course, of course. And so, yeah, so that was, that was when I, and then I just moved through the different iterations of the 5D. I just, that, that's been my setup since the beginning. Yeah. Paul, what's one of your most memorable moments and most iconic photos that you really admire the most? Yeah, I think I think um, I love I have a, I have a series that's sort of ongoing that didn't really start out as mm -hmm. uh, something I didn't really set out wanting to create uh, a cohesive sequence of it, series of images. Uh, but it blends, it's basically a hybrid of two of my favorite genres, which is climbing photography and astrophotography. And one night we decided to just try to blend the two genres together because, you know, sort of, I was thinking, well, I, I'm going to pick, pick ingredients for ingredients that I like and what, and, and only magic can come out of it kind of thing. And it was challenging. Mm -hmm. It's still a challenging type of photography to do because you have a lot working against you, but when it works, it's so rewarding. So a lot of my favorite image, at least locally here in the Rockies, are from that Astro Climbing series. And they feature, uh, they basically feature friends on, mm -hmm. uh, in the vertical world, uh, on vertical rock or ice uh, or, or uh, glacier ice or waterfall ice with um, a background of Milky Way or Aurora or um, Star Trails, stuff Paul, like that. Paul, did you know um, the late Matt Snell? Yes, yes, yeah. he was. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I mean, yes, yeah, such a... So such talented, a, wasn't such he? Such a talented guy, for sure, for sure. And And I was... Matt and I were became quite close because I had this mentorship program that's still ongoing. Yeah, I, and and yeah, Matt was one of the students one year, oh. uh, and so I got to know him quite well through that, and I got to 
get a window into how he was thinking as an artist and i'm so thankful that that i got that chance yeah such a talented guy for sure and he was from out east as well so i think somewhere in ontario yeah 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 yeah. we we miss him so much around here for sure rest in peace matt yeah he was a great guy for sure so paul i have a question for you you're out in the night sometimes and i've seen you on frozen lakes by yourself you're not scared like is there ever a moment that you've encountered something or your, your your leg has fallen through thin ice for a second or or wolves or bears or... yeah you know i think um i think part of it is i i think overall i've been very fortunate mm-hmm. there's no doubt about it that you know um the more you get out there the higher likelihood eventually something unfortunate is going to happen mm-hmm. i've i've spent more than my share of time out at night uh in those places i haven't had much honestly for unfortunate incidents um luck is definitely part of the equation um and part of it too is i think there's some there's some hazards that eventually you rationalize um there's some hazards that it's not necessarily the the correct hazards that get all the hype, right? Like the likelihood of an unfortunate wildlife encounter at night is so small, right? Of course. And and I think I think part of it is just, you know, the consequence of something happening can be pretty bad. And so even though the likelihood is small, it gets hyped up by the media, et cetera, all that. But Ah, meanwhile, you know, avalanches are always in the back of my mind, right? And those now, thankfully, there's more and more education, but that's one hazard that does deserve a lot more press, I think. Of course. And that people are way less, that people should be a lot more concerned about. Um, but I think part of it is just spending a lot of time, part of it is just experience, right. spending a lot of time on frozen lakes, doing a, taking a lot of measurements, um, not doing, um, try, trying to be trying to keep in mind that the photo of course is never worth um putting your life at stake and i think a lot of it is just the decisions that you make as a photographer often can lead to images that will seem a lot more risky than the situation Mm -hmm. actually was um just through the perspective you know you can mess with people's minds a little bit right through the decisions that you make in the field and i think for people who are not part of that world people who've never been on a frozen lake who have never been spend much time in the vertical world and it's very foreign to them it seems all the more daunting right but you know if you spend time in the vertical world that there's a lot of ways that you can mitigate the hazards we have a lot of gear that we can use um there's lots of um yeah it's like city folks here they know the roads they know the back roads they they can handle that right the yeah, yeah, yeah totally so i think you know the way that it's that like it's it's never a true representation that people get through social media and all that i think of the various the various risks um there's risks out there for sure and there there's no doubt that uh there's lots of times that looking back i you know uh, in hindsight uh, I gambled a little bit for sure, but I, I like to think that I'm getting a little bit smarter as the years go by. Paul, what was, you went to Greenland and I don't remember if you did this or not, but it's been on my bucket list. Did you go to the Faroe Islands? Yeah, I've made oh, a few trips God. there now. Yeah, for sure. Is and it a place think, to visit? Oh, absolutely. <sighs> I would say, and get there as quickly as you can, I would say, because it's changing extremely quickly. Uh, yeah. It's. I, it's, I feel like it's, sort of undergoing like it's 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 being subjected to the same sort of explosion that iceland uh like was exposed to you know five ten years ago commercialized and yeah you know small place um small country very um you know the terrain the terrain can be damaged easily yeah. uh the infrastructure is not sufficient to support mm-hmm. tourism in large numbers and so i would say uh i would encourage people to go you know 
Sooner than later, right? Sooner sooner than later. And if they go to be just super mindful of keeping things sustainable in the long run, Mm -hmm. I think the local authorities are kind of struggling to keep up with the the influx of tourists. Um, In a way, I'm thankful for COVID so that a lot of those countries can put some measures in place, get a break that they will never get again, you know, put, right. bring, bring tourism to a halt for an extended period of time so that they can rethink how they want to see, how they see themselves, how they see tourism uh, t- five, 10 years from now, and hopefully implement some changes that will make the place more sustainable. The pharaohs are so absolutely beautiful, unique, but it's, um, it's, it's fragile. Uh, Oh, it's, it's a fragile place. I mean, it gets, you know, destroyed by the weather. Uh, a lot of, and, and it's the kind of place where if people stray from the main areas, you can get some damage that will be basically irreparable. You know, it's never going to go back mm-hmm. to what it was before. A lot of the land, nearly all the land is privately owned. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of locals that are disgruntled, uh, understandably, and uh and so i think there's a little yeah there, there's do, do pictures there's do it of, justice do, do the pictures do it justice or in person's different like, oh i think it's like anywhere right i think it's it's uh majestic yeah it's an it's a battle that you'll never win as a photographer right you can never really convey a place the way that it really is um when you you come back to a play from a place like the pharaohs or greenland or the rockies and you want to grab everybody that you know by the hand and say you just i I just want to drag you there with me um because the pictures will yeah the pictures will never quite uh be like the experience did you go to the lighthouse yeah the light yeah yeah yeah, the, the lighthouse that's heavily photographed for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah on Calsoy. Yeah. yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's fa- it's it's one of those. I mean, even in a place like the Faroes, that it's where the standards in as far as scenery goes are so high. That island, uh, that island in particular, is even a notch above the rest. It's uh, it's just uh, yeah, it's straight out of a fairy tale. It's incredible. Oh, of course. Do you yeah. feel Banff is as fragile, or the Canadian Rockies is as fragile as Faroe Islands? I would say. I mean, we have we have more variety in terms of landscape. There's a lot of durable surfaces. You know, like you know, there's a lot of glaciers and moraines and rocky areas and places that you can go where it's. How do I put it? Like it's it's harder to leave a trace, even if you tried, right? Uh, like it's more, it, it can handle a lot more. Yeah. But then we also have those environments that are are extremely, extremely fragile, much like the pharaohs, where we have to tread very lightly. Yeah. Um, but the nice thing about the Rockies that the Rockies have going for them is the Rockies are massive. I mean, it's a huge, huge area. You can probably fit the pharaohs, you know, 300 times in the Rockies. Um, at, I don't know, other, I don't know the, the, the actual areas, but I haven't done the math, but I suspect it's, you know, hundredfold times that you can fit the pharaohs inside the Rockies. Uh, and so there's a lot to explore. And so um, people are more likely to spread out a little bit. Paul, if, if someone wants to be the, the next Paul... Ziska, or <laughs> wants to be be inspired and aspired by you. Can anybody just take a camera and learn? And is is there a way for us to like follow in your footsteps? So now that you said you have a mentorship, and I think you've been doing that for quite some time now. Yeah, I have. You know, I I think that that's a question that comes up often, and I think it's a great question, Zach. Um, I would say. In a way, you know, my, my concern when teaching photography is exactly that, in a way, is that people will follow in your footsteps instead of sort of venturing onto their own right. path. And then and then in doing so, they 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 rob us all of of the way that they view the world, right? Like and, and I, I think there's definitely everybody goes through a phase of emulation in photography as they learn, but my challenge as someone who teaches a lot is how to get people beyond that, right? Like now you've, you know how to recreate the images that you may have seen online multiple times. Mm -hmm. Now where, where people really hit the wall is like, now what, like, how do I push beyond that and, 
come up with a body of work that is uniquely, uniquely mine, that is unlike anybody else's. And I think, I think that comes with eventually um, just being disregarding online, the online reaction to some extent that your images get. Uh, do you cut out the noise? How do you deal with negative feedback? Because as an I, artist, it's tough at times. Or if you get a thumbs down or something, it's you're like, wow, that really... You know, we take it, at, it it's a part of us. Right? Oh, absolutely. We're close to our work and it's hard to not to take it personally. Um, I, I feel like um, f the, the main thing is usually... Uh, Usually I just, our policy is to not really engage, uh, especially if people, I find most of the time when you get negative feedback, it's not really provided to you in a way that's constructive. And, and when, when that's the case, usually we don't engage. We found that never really leads anywhere. Um, occasionally someone will provide feedback in a way that is constructive and that is helpful. And, uh, and those that type of feedback I will respond to for sure. Uh, but if it's feedback in the form of like, I like it or I don't like it, well, it I, I, I doesn't bother me too much. I mean- Everyone's got know, their own opinion, right? Yes, and yes, exactly. And, and you, can, you can never please everybody. No. And especially, you know, as the audience grows, um, there's always gonna be more and more people who are not happy with the direction that you're going. Uh, but you can't just pay too much attention to that. Uh, I think I, I, I personally really admire artists, photographers or others who are bold enough and confident enough to put their images out there and say, look, this is my view of the world. If you like it, great. I had fun creating it. It was fulfilling to me. And if you don't like it, that's okay. And it's yeah. not a big deal. And I find that there's a lot of desperation on social media. And whenever you come across an artist that is bold and confident that way, I find that's really a, a breath of fresh air. Uh, just put your work out there and um, just accept right off the bat that you just can't please everybody. Just, just make sure that you're happy with the direction you're going. That's all you can do, right? Paul, what was your biggest break before we finish up here? I know you got to get going too, but what was your, the photo or moment where you just skyrocketed on social media? Cause I mean, like I said, I've been following you from the beginning when Instagram had come around and you know, we were all on there and next thing I know, it just like, whew, um, I would say, honestly, um, was it a photo, a moment? No, I, we've never, honestly, we've never chased the stats, Zach. Yeah. Like I've always been, and there's four of us involved in social media now. And the goal is I want to get away from that. The likes, like, the followers. Oh the, yeah. I mean, yeah. that's not, it's just not a sustainable way of doing photography. And my business model is not based on that. So it's not like I see more money in my bank account no. as my followers go up. There's not, it's not necessarily directly proportional. We're really more after an audience that is genuinely interested, interested enough that once in a while they will spend 10 bucks, 20 bucks, a thousand bucks on what we're doing. Right. Um, and so I think that things at least not necessarily as far as social media stats but when things started looking better from a per, from a business perspective for us was when we really did what i just mentioned mm -hmm. like yeah. when we just when i just decided to just create the images that far that got me fired up that was excited to work on put them out there i love that yeah. kind of disregard and accept the fact that i'm going to lose a whole bunch of people and Instead, I'm going the right people, not the right people, the, the people that I'm gunning for, those people will notice. It's right? almost as cliche as it sounds, but your vibe will attract your tribe. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I think, you know, everybody knows the recipe to creating popular images online now. They've been, everything's been tested now. And if, if, what we, if what we wanted was to generate... Well, then we know the recipe, right? But I, I just don't, and I've been guilty of going down that route at times. And I've seen that it's not sustainable for me. You know I, what it I, is? I, it's, it's, you're not being true to your own self. 
Yes. And then I just, I just start and I'm, I still do it. I go out there, become a bit of a robot, yeah. mindlessly create images that will know, I know will explode online, but that will me, leave me sort of empty creatively. That don't really propel me forward as a photographer because I'm just microwaving old ideas that I can now do fairly easily, mindlessly, but I'm not doing anything, um, that will propel me for myself. And I'm not, I feel like I'm not contributing anything fresh to the community, the photo community as a whole, you know? Paul, so, I always wonder this, yeah. you put something really amazing out there and everyone loves it. Now you have pressure on yourself. Shoot, will my next image be as, <laughs> have you ever dealt with that as an artist? Yeah, for sure. You know, I, I, I think I'd be dishonest if I said, I don't care what people think, you know, no, I think- course if nobody likes your images, your business is not going to go very far. I have to pay attention to what people think. I'm very lucky because what I like, what I naturally like to shoot ice and climbing and mountains and the wilderness and stars and the aurora, people happen to respond to that very strongly. So I don't have to bend very much in terms of what I like to shoot. Um, but yeah, once in a while, you have a few images in a row that people will respond very strongly to. And then you'll put something out there that you had a blast shooting that you feel is cutting edge work and it'll just fall flat on its face. And that's where one of the real tests, that's when you're really tested as a photographer where you have to keep your head high and just just commit to the process and just keep on going, right? Paul, and, now, yeah. and if someone wants... If someone and just wants to get out again, right? You just go out there and create. That's the best. The best remedy to those types of reactions is just let's plan another adventure and let's just go. Get, keep getting after it. Yeah. yeah, Paul. If someone wants to be a student, to end this off, what do they do? How can they reach you and be a student of your of your courses? Actually, because you took a bunch of students, I remember pre-COVID to Greenland. Yeah. 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 And so I've got uh, I've got through my side company Offbeat that I Offbeat. operate with Dave Brosha. We do international workshops. We'll be resuming those as soon as COVID allows. Um, so that's one way that people can learn from me if they're interested. Otherwise, back at the beginning of the pandemic, I started my Patreon account where uh, we have a really nice community. Uh, and that's something that's really affordable to everyone. And we post fresh content weekly. So I would say that's probably uh, a good route a good. for people, or at least a good introduction. And then people can decide whether or not, you know, it's a big commitment to go to Greenland with some guy you don't know for 10 days. And I get that. <laughs> and so if people want to see sort of what I'm about and what I'm like as a person, I think Patreon is the mm -hmm. next logical step. So just look me up on there. Perfect. Thanks so much, Paul, for your time today. It was really a pleasure talking to you, Zach. Thanks for all the great questions. Wishing you and your family a lovely New Year 2021. Thanks so much and all the best to you too, Zach. Thank you, Paul. Chat later. Yeah, you bet. Thanks a lot.